Hello, people of the sun. Thank you for joining me in another one of these episodes. This is a place where we explore the magic, the mysticism, uh, the theology, and other topics regarding uh, the people from Mesoamerica. This episode is uh, a little bit of a combination between the Chronicles of Pedro de Alvarado, Hernán Cortés, and the theology of the Aztecs and other people of Mesoamerica. When Pedro de Alvarado first saw Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City, for the first time, he said that he thought that he was seeing a vision, that he was in a dream, that he could not believe it. There were towers and smoke piles just rising up into the sky. There were avenues of channels of water. It was a vision. He could not understand how could something exist in, on Earth that looked like that. It was so massive, and, and, and it was so massive that he was not able to understand how were so many people able to live in that place. And once they went down to the city, uh, him and Hernán Cortés uh, learned about the Aztec way of life and the way they conducted their society. This was even more of a difficult thing to understand for them. One of the primary terms that they learned was the term Tlatuani. Tlatuani is uh, equivalent to what I understood as king. King or sovereign was a term that they were familiar with, but the term great speaker was not a term that they could equate with uh, someone that had so much power and was able to lead so many people. And as a result, uh, it is uh, worthwhile to try to understand what does the term Tlatuani mean for the Aztecs. Not necessarily for how the Spanish were able to understand it, uh, but how were the Aztecs going to uh, give meaning to that particular term? And this is what this episode is all about. Thank you very much, and let's go. To try to understand the term Tlatuani, we have to uh, go back a few steps in our understanding of reality. Our standard of reality, as far as it goes, most power is dependent upon money. Previously, a lot of power was dependent upon military prowess or military occupation, but today uh, uh, tariffs or impositions on certain economic power uh, can, can debilitate or empower uh, certain countries or regions or people. And so we have to understand that the people from Mesoamerica did not have money per se. They detraded cocoa beans, I mean, uh, to try to use some type of currency. But the people from Mesoamerica, uh, they depended heavily on trade. And also the everyday people did not have a lot of power over their goods or over the land. And therefore, the people that control most of the goods and most of the land and most of the power were the people in power. In this case, the Tlatoani. And so, what does the term Tlatoani mean as a great speaker? What does it speak about? What does that mean? In a way, it's kind of similar to uh, John in the Bible where it says in the beginning there was the worth. Uh, that is exactly what it is. Uh, the term word came from uh, Quetzalcoatl. This was a creation type of myth. When the gods created humanity, human humans were not um, mobile, they were not able to think very much, they were kind of just limp. And as such, Quetzalcoatl grabbed his conch and he was able to blow life into the, into the bodies of humans and they became inanimate thinking and the, and the humans that we see today. And so the word of Quetzalcoatl was the word that animated humanity. And in a similar form, they, since the kings or the Tlatoani were to emulate themselves to gods, they believed that their word was similar to the word of Quetzalcoatl that they had the power to create life, to end life. They had the power to take over land. They had the power to make uh, rain, to make the heavens rain. They had the power for some uh, 
particular land to give fruit, some particular land to not give fruit, and so people were made to believe that he was the god that had control over humanity, which in a way it is true. Uh, if the Tlatuani wanted to kill a particular number of people, he had the power to say to his armies, go kill that number of people. If he wanted to destroy a piece of land, they went to throw salt at the particular piece of land and it will not be able to give um, fruit. Or if they wanted it to be uh, fruitful, then they were able to be able to harvest it or to take care of it. And so even though the Tlatoani was not a god, he certainly had the power to control the lives of the people under his reign. The Tlatoani uh, he, by definition, was the, the ruler and the owner of all the land. He was the owner of all the people. And as we read the chronicles of the people under the Tlatoani, they saw him as a father, not necessarily as a ruler, which sometimes he was a very despotic, mean, bloodthirsty ruler. But they saw him as a father, as a giver of life, as a giver of guidance, given a giver of um, a lot of the benefits that they enjoyed and security. But the Tlatoani was not always as nice as he was depicted on some uh, chronicles. Sometimes he is depicted as a man that demanded the lives of certain people to give forth to sacrifices during the flower wars, I guess we can call it. And he was also a quite a demanding type of god or ruler. Now, being at Latuani, it uh, carried multiple levels of power. Not only that Latuani was a god on this life, but it was also a god in other lives. After he died, thanks to the Estela of Pakal, we're able to understand that the kings of the, of the Meso people from Mesoamerica, they understood that even when their kings or their Tlatoanis died, they went into the heavens and they were able to be communicators through the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is where the gods are able to determine the lives of people, they're able to determine the passage of time, or are able to measure the passage of time and the drama of time. If you watch my, my episode on the magic of time, you'll be able to understand more as to what does that mean. Time was dependent upon the existence or appearance of particular gods, their victories, their defeats, and as such, they were able to time when to, uh, when to plant, when to harvest, when uh, there was going to be bad days, when there were going to be good days. Uh, when there was going to be good luck, bad luck, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the religion of the people from Mesoamerica was dependent upon that calendar. And so when the Tlatoani died, it was said that he became part of that system, that he became a celestial object uh, that will control part of that time. And this was done in a way to legitimize their bloodline in case uh, somebody tried to rule and they, didn't, they did not believe that the grandson or the, or the nephew of the king should rule. They will pull the celestial being, celestial god card and say, this is why I should be allowed to rule. Which in a way is very similar to the European kings where they said that they had the divine right to rule. But the Tlatuani was not the only one that had the word. The priests for some of the gods, they also had the power to say a particular word and it became true. Uh, the priest, uh, kind of like in uh, 300 Spartans, the movie if you have seen it, uh, they're able to determine whether a war should be fought or whether it, we should leave him alone. And so the priests were able to make predictions on which war should be won and which one should be left, which war should be left alone, or what action should be taken based on the proclaimed desires of the particular gods, which of course the priest was able to, to, to interpret. But this was mostly used as a political tool in which the, the kings or the Tlatoani worked together with the priests to control the system of religion for the benefit of the higher class and therefore oppress the lower class. And the next people in power were the Ekatkatl, the generals. The generals, uh, depending on their warrior class, were able to have a lot of power 
the, in the in particularly in the battlefield they were able to determine who was going to live who was going to die who was going to become a captive to be taken for sacrifices and the generals had a lot of power because they were the ones on the front lines that were um, subduing uh, other other people and as it, as it was the case in Rome the generals had a lot of power over political interest because they were the ones that had the first hand power as opposed to just wards but the religion came first and the king came first and so the warriors and the generals they cut the cattle were uh, kind of like third in command as far as what was their worth and the next people in power for people like you and me merchants traders worksmen uh, but these were the people that generated a lot of the goods uh, they were the people that uh, transported uh, food they were the people that, gave, so that provided services but the the reward was not quite was not celestial for the military and for the priest and for the king there was a celestial divine ward but uh, for us commoners our ward was simply taken in uh, little little pauses or little bits of pieces of divine will but the ward was certainly effective because that is what made the uh, mesoamerican world uh, go around what actually provided food and provided everything for the societies uh, we can see that in the in the in the city or in the on, on the market of Tlatelolco. Uh, to this day, is still um, a very important merchant center, and a lot of the merchant centers that were still in the time of the Aztecs are still there in Mexico City. Now they're called either Tepito or La Merced or Lagunilla. Uh, Tlatelolco now it goes by, uh, by, by, by different names, uh, but they're still there and they still... So regardless of their nature and regardless of where they live, humans live in a very similar way. Except in, in, in Europe, they had gold and silver to try to trade. In Mesoamerica, they also had gold, they have jade, they had obsidian, they have cocoa beans and they traded uh, goods and services for these particular items but the king was always in control or the Tlatoani and the noble elite also had a lot of control which of course in Europe you also had the knights and the princes and, and so on and so forth so there are not a lot of differences it seems that human nature is very common when it comes to financial and political interest but uh, it is good to learn about the people from Mesoamerica to try to understand that these uh, people were not as good and peaceful as a lot of people think they were. There were a lot of power struggles, there were a lot of ruthless wars, there were uh, some horrific acts of genocide. And so when people think that the indigenous people of this, uh, of this continent were nice or they were very proud of their culture, uh, sometimes we have to look a little bit at ourselves to try to understand where they came from. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and if you'd like to like and subscribe, I will appreciate it. I would like to keep making these videos. Thank you very much and have a good one. Bye-bye.